الله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Just as a reminder for myself and a reminder for those listening, uh, the purpose of these short sessions is to connect with the Quran. to connect with the uh, Qur'an so that we realize its relevance in our normal day-to-day -day life. In our normal day-to-day -day life. Um, so hopefully the last two, three sessions that we've had so far, you've got a flavor, a taste of how we're trying to deliver this. And the reason is, and this is important, and I know I've repeated myself, is that we find, obviously, that the Qur'an is still relevant to us. Unfortunately, for many of us, the Qur'an becomes something that we recite. And absolutely, don't get me wrong, there is reward. It's a ritual act of worship to recite the Qur'an, uh, whether with meaning or without meaning. Uh, it's a rewarding aspect for every letter you know, for every in, you know, wow, alif, noon, every single letter we're getting a reward for, without any doubt. But it's also a message for us in terms of how we should live our life. Hence, it's important that not only do we understand it, but we understand it to our normal sort of day-to-day -day life. Today, I'll start off from a surah, a second para. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Ba'da a'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim bismillahi rahman rahim سَيَكُولُ السُّفَهَاءُ مِنَ النَّاسِ مَا وَلَّاهُمْ عَنْ قِبْلَتِهِمُ الَّتِي كَانُوا وَلَيْهَا سَيَكُولُ سُون السُّفَهَاء سَفِيهُن سُفَهَاء Soon the foolish people, the people who have uh, lack of insight, people who lack a serious level of intellect from the people, the thing they will say is, why did they move from the Qibla that they were on? They used to pray towards a certain direction. They used to pray towards a certain Qibla. Why did they change? So Allah SWT tells the Prophet of Allah SWT to respond. He says, Qul, لِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِقُ وَالْمَغْرِبْ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ إِلَىٰ سِرَاتِ مُسْتَقِيمٍ For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the direction of the east or the direction of the west. The whole earth belongs to Allah. Which way you face, you are technically turning to Allah. I'm not giving a fiqh answer here, I'm giving a more philosophical understanding. Whichever way you turn, there is Allah. He guides who he wishes towards the straight path. In this way, we have made you a moderate religion. A religion which is balanced. Why? So that you may be shuhada, witnesses against the people on the Day of Judgment, وَيَكُونُ رَسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ shahida, And the messenger can be a witness against you. So this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's model for ensuring we live a moral and ethical life on the planet. The Muslim deen, the Islam, has been chosen as a religion which is balanced between extremism and laxity, laziness. So we will find on the planet, a person's religion could be anything. Football could be a person's religion. Music could be a person's religion. When I use the word religion, I don't mean that there's certain ritual acts, even though there might be. Religion means the way of life that you have chosen, the way you wish to live. So whenever we hear the word religion, we always sort of think, oh, well, Judaism, Islam, this. No, I think we need to maybe re use a different word rather than the word religion. Rather, use the term, the way of life that you have decided to live. What is your motivation? What do you consider to be right? What do you consider to be wrong? What do you use to decide what is right? What do you use to decide what is wrong? That is, in essence, the lifestyle that you've chosen. How you choose to dress, how you choose to eat, what you choose to eat, all these are a way of life how you choose to have relationships with anybody, whether the opposite gender or not. All these are lifestyle choices. All these are choices we make all the time. And this is what a religion is. Not necessarily that do I read the Quran, do I read the Bible or whatever. 
It's not in that way. And this is why we need to understand this better. So Allah SWT made the religion of Islam balanced in the middle. Meaning that we can work on Friday. We don't have a Sabbath. So we can get up in the morning, go, get, go job, work, earn, whatever. And then as long as we take out an hour or two for Juma Salah, pray Juma Salah, get back to work. We're not required that as soon as the sunset of Thursday comes in, that we cannot even press a button on a lift. Like the way the Jewish community, the Orthodox <coughs> Jews, when they practice Sabbath, they won't do anything. They will make sandwiches the day before because even pressing the microwave button is doing work. So Allah SWT made their religion very difficult. You, some, you could say maybe impractical in some ways. With our religion there was ease. And I mentioned other eases as well. Then we have the other side where a person's whims and desires is their religion. <coughs> their idol is their own ego. That is what they worship. They worship their own ego. Their ego says do this so they obey. The ego says dress like this so they obey. The ego says have relationships with so and so so they obey. So they have actually set up their ego as a god. And they follow the religion of the ego. So these are, even though we don't say this is a religion, and because we get caught up by these terms, and we don't truly understand. But then, who are the judges? If we become witnesses, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Yawm al qiyamah is going to call the Muslims as the witnesses against people, whoever lived in our era, in our time, then who will bear witness against us to ensure that we have also lived by the deen? So our own messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is going to be the witness against us. And that's quite a frightening statement to make. Because we consider him to be the most merciful human on the surface of the earth. For him to be called into the prosecution box against his own fellow Muslims is one of the hardest things which the Prophet sallallahu will bear. And he found this very difficult. He found this very, very difficult to bear witness against his own people. And we did not make this change in the Qibla that you were used to be upon, except in order to determine, or in this case, in order to make apparent, because Allah SWT knows all, in order to make apparent who actually follows the Messenger of Allah and who is going to turn on his heels, who is going to abandon this religion. وَإِن كَانَتْ لَكَبِيرَةً إِلَّا عَلَى الَّذِينَ هَدَ اللَّهِ And this is indeed difficult. This point in the deen of Islam, this, this, this junction is going to be extremely difficult except those whom Allah SWT guides. Again, I always try to say is picture yourself in, you know, delve into the Qur'an. Become part of the Qur'an. What is happening? The Muslims were in Makkah. In Makkah, they were persecuted. They were killed, they were ridiculed, they were laughed at. For two, three years they lived in the valleys surrounding Makkah. They, did not, they could not feed, they could not eat because their trade embargoes were placed against them. So nobody would do business with them. They weren't allowed, nobody was allowed to marry from them. So their daughters would get older, their sons would get older, but nobody would come for marriage. And they lived like this for three years through this great difficulty. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes an opening. He permits hijrah. The Muslims leave, they go to Medina. When they arrive in Medina, they sought salvation of being counted amongst the Ahli Kitab in Makkah. So for the mushriks, they couldn't really work out what religion Rasulullah was professing. For the Jewish people, they saw them like the Christians, that they're just a sect of Judaism. They're no different. At first, they denied them because they saw the lineage of all Anbiya to come through Ishaq And yet Rasulullah was coming through the lineage of Ismail So they had issue with that, they had concern. Because they would have to accept that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had turned against them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had now no longer blessed their lineage. He was now going to bless the lineage of Ismail So at that time, Rasulullah and the Muslims in the world need to be part of somebody. When you are a small minority, when you are a small group, you try to find and work with other people. I get lots of questions from the States, from Europe, that can we work with other minorities when it means that the Muslim voice is heard? Even if those minorities we don't agree with, they may be fundamentally different than us. 
but can we stand shoulder to shoulder with them when it comes to fighting general causes? So in this case, the Muslims look like the Jews, the Muslims behave like the Jews, and the Muslims are praying towards Bayt al-Maqdis. So when the Messenger of Allah used to pray in Makkah, he could pray in such a way that he would have Makkah, uh, the Kaaba in front of him, and he would pray in a direction when he did pray publicly, in such a way that Bayt al-Maqdis was there, so there would be a line that you could draw from the Kaaba to Bayt al-Maqdis. So he managed to pray towards Bayt al-Maqdis, but also pray to the Kaaba at the same time. However, when he moved to Medina, now it was impossible to pray towards Makkah and towards Bayt al-Maqdis. It's impossible to do that because they're two separate directions. So for the first 16 months or so, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and also the Muslims prayed towards Bayt al-Maqdis. They did not pray towards the Kaaba. In this way, the Jewish people provided some support because the Muslims were no different than the Jewish people. The <coughs> Jewish people ate kosher, Muslims ate halal. They recognized the same anbiya, the same names. So they had an affiliation. And that gave strength and protection to the Muslims. So otherwise, Aus and Khazraj at that time hadn't converted. There was obviously mass conversions which took place after. But at that time, there was many mushriks. Obviously, there were many munafikun. There was no need for the munafikun in Mecca because there was open hatred for the believers. So there's no need to conceal. But once the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu arrived in Medina and he became the statesman and he became a powerful man, then now the enemies came with, with concealed ideas, with... with tricks up their sleeves and this proved more difficult so this turning away would mean that also that community which provided support that community which meant that the Muslims were part of Ahli Kitab would now also turn against them and we hear and this will be repeated throughout so when people turned some people unfortunately could not accept that the Messenger of Allah was now identifying through Allah subhanahu wa command a new direction for the Muslims, a new way forward for the Muslims, in which the Muslims would not be defined by others, in which the Muslims would define themselves. And this is a historic moment. It's a historic moment when we go back, if we, as I said, if we could embed ourselves in the Quran, and if we were back in Medina at that time, for this to happen, this was huge. This was huge. The fallout of this, the discussions, the talking in the markets, the plotting against the Prophet of Allah, وسلم, these conversations, they became more. <laughs> we see you turn your face towards the heavens. Allah SWT addresses the Prophet of Allah. So we're now going to turn you towards the Qibla that you desire. So he shows that the Prophet of Allah wanted to turn towards the Kaaba. Well, he waited on permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we know that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a shari, he can't bring sharia. It's not that we just follow, we're not Quranists. We don't just follow what the Quran says. We are Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah. Yani we also follow what the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. So that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made certain things halal and he made certain things haram. And the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made certain things halal and he made certain things haram. We know for example that he made Medina into a haram. Like the way Ibrahim والسلام, had made Makkah into a haram. So we see many of these. I just one example. For Wali Wajaka Shatr al Masjid al Haram. So he has to now turn your face into the direction of Masjid al Haram. And whichever place you are, wherever you are on the surface of the earth, that is the direction that you will turn towards. And then Allah says that these people who are actually having a go at you, who are actually criticizing you, they know that you would come and they know that your Qibla would be towards the Kaaba. They know that as much as they know their own sons. And if you think that by turning this way, you are losing your friendship with the Jews, that you're losing the only side or the only people that may could, could resemble you or could connect with you, then no matter what sign you bring, no matter what proof you've been, they will not accept you. Neither should you follow their direction. You have your own identity. And here we see throughout 
Allah SWT mentioning again and again, and I mentioned earlier, الَّذِينَ آتَيْنَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ Like they know their own sons, they know. And Allah SWT repeats again, وَمِنْ حَيْثُ خَرَجْتَ فَوَلِّ وَجَكَ الشَّاتِ الْمَشْرِ الْحَرَامِ And again, وَمِنْ حَيْثُ خَرَجْتَ فَوَلِّ وَجَكَ الشَّاتِ الْمَشْرِ الْحَرَامِ وَحَيْثُ مَا كُنْتُمْ فَوَلِّ وُجُوكُمْ شَتْلُ In fact, you see it nearly half a dozen times, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizing this point. Now, this is no small thing. As I mentioned to you before when in the Fajr sessions, that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats something, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making an emphasis, that shows that this, because for us, we just read it and, you know, turn the page and we're, we're, we're gone. But this is such a momentous point where the Muslim's self-identity came through. It's a massive play. It's a massive thing that happened but unfortunately we need to go to the books of the ulama and read how huge this was and I say unfortunately because we don't do that that's why I said unfortunately we have to go to the books of the ulama because that would mean that we have to actually seek something and we, we stop there and then the whole point of this addressing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what are you afraid of you think that people won't be on your side. You think that you will be isolated. You think that you will be a minority. You think that everybody's going to point at you. You think people are going to ridicule you. You think people are going to laugh at you. Why do you fear? Allah SWT says, فَلَا تَخْشَهُمْ Don't be frightened or scared of them. If there is anyone you should be frightened or scared of, وَخْشَوْنِي Fear me. Fear me, Allah SWT says. And in order that my, I may complete my favor upon you so that you may be guided. That small group of people, that tiny group of people who arrived in Medina, identified their own faith, changed direction to pray towards Qibla. Already they were different to the Ahli Kitab, yani the Christians. They now made a clear difference with the Jews. They stood alone. Hundreds of Muslims, at best maybe a thousand or two. Look where that goes now. Two billion Muslims. Two billion. So can you see? Now we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills everything and he plans everything. But that strategic decision through the Quran that Nabi Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made to self-identify, to give themselves this descriptor that yes, we are Ahli Kitab, but we are different. We have been sent as witnesses against all nations, like the way the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi will be a witness against us. And then Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala mentions the role of the Messenger of Allah. Kama arsalna fiikum rasula minkum, like we sent amongst you messages from you. All the messengers came from the people, so that they may address their people. Why? We all know our own cultural habits. I'm Pukhtun, I know what my people do, what they don't do. Where their Biddats come in, where their non Biddats are there. I know I've been raised in that, I grew up in that, I attend weddings, funerals, whatever. <coughs> people who come from my background will relate to me stronger. So we all relate to people who come from our own background stronger. Hence, you find many of the youngsters switch off from ulama who may come from abroad or, or whatever because they say, I can't connect with that Mawlana. I can't connect with that Sheikh because I'm English, I'm born and raised here. He doesn't know the issues that I'm facing. Hence the reason the importance of those ulama and those of us who study here to engage with our communities here because that's absolutely essential. So, kama arsalna fikum rasula minkum yatlu alaykum ayatina. The first thing that the job that we have as da'is, the first job that we have and then we become inshallah ta'ala ulama is that we recite the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is to ensure the recitation, to ensure the tajweed, to ensure that Quranic recitation is done regularly and we engage with that. Wa yuzakikum and to purify you. We spoke with the Mu'takifun upstairs about this process of purification today or yesterday. About how one of our jobs is to purify ourselves. Not just the ritual aspects or how we become pure and cleaner. When you alimukumul kitab, and also that we understand the sharia, and also wal hikmah and its application. 
وَيُعَلِّمُكُمْ مَا لَمْ تَكُونُوا تَعْلِمُونَ And also so that they may know and they are taught that which they did not know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then mentions فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ وَاشْكُرُوا لِي وَلَا تَكْفُرُونَ You may hear this ayah in Jummah Khutbah. So remember me and I will remember you. Be grateful to me and do not be ungrateful. Now in this short ayah we see that we have to make the first move. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Remember me, then I will remember you. Okay, don't expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open doors for you. Don't expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to change your halat in your life. Don't expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do anything for you. Okay, the first thing you have to do is recognize his authority, recognize his rub. It's like a parent with a child, and the child expects things from the parent. Until the child respects the father first, until the child respects the mother first, then the child should have expectations that my mother should do something for me, my father should do something for me. They should not have those expectations at the beginning, because why are you expecting them to do something for you if you don't even respect their authority? You only expect something from them because you know that they're in a position of authority, that they can do something for you. But you're not acknowledging that authority. So do you see the conundrum? Yeah, the catch-22. So we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the authority. We don't worship him and then we want him to solve our problems. But we have to recognize his authority first. We have to recognize him first. We have to worship him first. Then he will. And be grateful to me and don't be ungrateful. And we're spending five, ten minutes after Fajr Salah to do that, just that. To do the shukr of Allah, to spend five, ten minutes after Fajr Salah to do the shukr. Last ayah, and I will leave you, inshallah. Ya yuwaladina amanusta inu bi sabri wa salah, inna Allah ma sabri. One of the most misunderstood concepts is sabr. Okay, one of the most misunderstood concepts in Islam is what's, what is sabr. Or those of you who believe, seek help. Istainu, find help in your life. We all go through problems in our life. Whether it's family problems, work problems, health problems, we all have issues in life. Nobody's life is perfect. How are we supposed to solve that? The first thing Allah SWT says is, this is important. He says, bis sabri was salah. He didn't say, bis salah was sabr. He didn't say that. He said, bis sabri was salah. By patience. Now in fact, people think patience is the lack of doing anything. Yani, you're just waiting for something to happen. Okay, so it's like inaction. Patience is actually action. I'll explain to you with an example. Say somebody comes up to me and punches me in the face. Okay, punches me in the face. What's my normal reaction going to be? I'm from Bradford. What's my normal reaction going to be? Run. Hit him back. No, no, run. Come on, man. <laughs> you and I are having words. You're looking at him. So... My normal reaction is to hit him back. So what's easier? To hit him back, isn't it? That's natural. Uh, do I have to think? Do I have to think, okay, now I need to pick my hand up, aim for his... That's a natural reaction. It's actually unnatural. It requires action to be patient. Do you understand? People always think patience is inaction, like, oh, I'll be patient, so I won't do anything. I'll just, you know... It's not. Sabr is the only action. The rest are automatic uh, things that we have within us to, to, to do things. So sabr is the act. We know, for example, from a hadith, the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu walked past a graveyard and a lady is crying and lamenting over a grave. She's, she's really crying loudly. And so the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu says, Ispiri wa ahtasibi, yani be patient and seek reward. Obviously, she didn't know who he was. So she says, da'ani, you know, go away. You know, you don't know what I'm going through. She thought, you know, he's a bloke. He doesn't know what a mother feels when a mother loses their child. It's easy for you to say. Afterwards, someone mentions to her, do you know who that person you addressed? She goes, no, who was it? She goes, it was the Prophet of Allah. That also shows the remarkable nature of the Prophet of Allah. It's a, his humility, his humbleness. That he wasn't even recognized by, by, by his followers, subhanAllah. And, you know, now in the world that we live in, you know, Ajib, hey, you, you know, if somebody doesn't come up to you and shake your hand because you're a big scholar, you look up like, you know, <laughs> Ajib, Banda. you know, do you, do you know what I mean? Here is Nabi Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam walking past the graveyard and his own follower doesn't recognize him. Right? That, that shows his remarkable nature. So anyway, so once, once she's informed of who he is, 
she goes and she mentions, she mentions in the hadith that I did not find any doorkeepers. That again reconnects with that humility, humbleness. He had no protection, you know, many times when you want to get to big scholars, you've got to go through lots of gatekeepers. You know, you have to speak to Shagid number 64 first. <laughs> Only Shagid number 64 gives you ijazah, then you go to number 63, then he gives you ijazah, you get to 62. By the time you reach the Sheikh, he's passed away. <laughs> you think, Chalo, I'll go back to the other one. You know, now nah, don't get me wrong, I say that tongue in cheek. Obviously, for some of us to be completely, you know, for all, every person was bombarding the ulama, you know, 24 7, the poor guy wouldn't, you know, be able to do normal things. But, you know, I'm exaggerating that point, but it's a fair point as well. So she goes, there was no doorkeeper, so I walked in. So I said, Ya Rasulullah, I will be patient. I will be patient. <laughs> so he says, in words to that effect, I paraphrase, what choice have you got now but to be patient? What are you going to do? Bring the, I'm using my words now, what are you going to do? You're going to bring the dead back to life. You have to be patient now, what else are you going to do? So patience is that time when your natural reaction is to do something. Your natural reaction is to do something. Strike out. You know, you're having an argument with the missus. She's not putting enough salt in. And you never explain the muscle to her that she could taste it. That's the only muscle men know, don't they? A mufsab is it jazz for your wife to taste uh, food? Why are you asking me that for? Because you see, I like my you know, salt in rye and I like my chili rye and you know, it gets me really angry. You know, I still get questions like that from sisters saying, can I taste uh, the food? I say, why? Because my husband gets really angry. I think so. He's fasted all day. And whilst he's breaking fast, he's showing anger to his wife who spent five hours in the kitchen cooking. Ajeeb, honestly. And the Fukaha mentioned it, I know he's asking, is it nice? <laughs> so he could text his wife. Uh, you can't taste it now, so my beatings will be not right. So when she sees him, she goes, I will be patient. So this thing about patience is when we have an argument with the wife or had an, you know, a do with the next door neighbor because he's always parked in my spot. Or he leaves his own spot and he parks in mine. Why is he doing that for? For whatever reason, we end up in an argument. You know, we are humans, we argue all day. Okay. At that time, the normal reaction is to raise your voice, to get physical, to get aggressive, to do whatever. Patience is the ability to be able to control that. And that is very hard. Very hard. Very difficult. So it's not inaction. It's not running away. It is the ability to deal with that situation in the way Allah SWT teaches. Obviously, we don't have time to go, go into great. I know you, everybody wants to recite some Quran as well. And Salah. Because Allah SWT is with as sabiri He is with as sabiri So may Allah SWT give us a tawfiq to understand who we are and be able to practice the deen as he should. Ameen. Wa akhla wa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. As-salamu alaykum.